Hey, it's Barry Mole still getting small business unstuck. And today we're going to talk about reimagining your business. This morning they announced that now almost 20 million people are now out of work, about 15% of Americans, and small businesses are closing by the millions. Here to join us to talk about how you can reimagine your business so you can thrive in this economy is Tracy Therion. Tracy, tell us a little about yourself. Hi, Barry. Um, I'm uh, the CEO of Bamboo Worldwide, and we are an innovation agency, and we work with really big companies around the world and help them come up with new ideas. So in this case, with the economy just really changing the last three weeks, what can a small business do to reimagine their business in this new economy? Mm -hmm. Well, what's funny is that our clients that are really big fortune 50 to 100 companies actually have less flexibility than these small businesses. So they're built into supply chains and manufacturing lines and sales teams and infrastructures where they have thousands of people working for them. So actually if small business can see themselves as being able to uh, actually grow from this and have an advantage in their nimbleness and their um, ability to change quickly because they might have more flexibility and they might not be so locked into some of those capital commitments, they can really see the world with new eyes. And so, we'll be, oh, go ahead. No, no, it, but it's scary, right? Because you have a business that's going along and you're really good at doing something, right? Yep. Your customers like it, they come, they support you, they pay. And now you have to close your eyes and imagine a world where people don't leave their homes and you gotta do something different and you have to get outside your comfort zone, so it's hard. Absolutely, we, we say be comfortable being uncomfortable, but it's really uncomfortable. And it's hard to think about how to reimagine when you have scarcity. So that's real, I've mm -hmm. felt it, you felt it. As small business owners, we, we probably think better and dream bigger when we don't have scarcity. And so it's about trying to get out of the negativity as hard as that can be to think about what would it look like if I was just creating from scratch something new? And then trying to look at what are the opportunities that I can pursue right now to deliver a service that might be very different than what I did two months ago to survive right now and thrive later. So if you're not thinking about it as such a long-term commitment, you can pivot a little easier. Some people I think get stuck because they're so worried that if they make a change right now, they're stuck in that for forever for the length of the history of their company. So how do you, I mean, I love this idea that it's really hard to be creative to reimagine when you're in a place of scarcity. I mean, if you sit mm -hmm. down and you're making millions of dollars and it's just broad ideas, right? We can do this, we can do that. How do you move into that place where you actually can do it when most small businesses right now are just freaking out? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, one of the things that I try to do to calm my mind when I've had that kind of scarcity is I try to think about what's working right now that is relevant and marketable. So what do I have that I can sell now, right off the shelf, a service, a product, a program, but what can I sell now that is relevant? And then I think about, okay, that's my first tier. Those are low hanging fruit. And then second, I think about what are the resources, relationships maybe, knowledge, data, assets, people, skills that I have that I can use to sell something to someone. And that is where you really have to push your boundaries out. So we always say that it's really hard to start with a blank sheet of paper. You have to have some kind of guardrails. So if you start with those things, what are the current things I have that mm -hmm. I could sell, give, do, or offer? and work from those and start to mind map off of those, all of the things that you have to offer first. So you come up with your inventory of assets, your knowledge, data, people, skills, services. I love that because you said you can't really start with a blank piece of paper. You go, oh, let's just start with a blank piece of paper, but you really can't. Yeah. And, I, and I really like what you say, you have to think about what your core competencies are. I was talking with a client the other day, which is one of the biggest sellers of office products on Amazon, right? Uh, yeah. Your business really has gone down. And I said, well, let's think about what your core competency is. And his core competency is really, he's created all these data models about how to get, how to do advertising that brings a return on Amazon and sells products. So I said, well, you could be selling anything. Your, uh -huh. core, your core competency isn't the office supplies. It's really the models you put together to get a return on Amazon advertising. So exactly. I love that you say that. Yeah, so we have skills to, let's say, sell a widget we can sell another widget that is in need right now. 
And we certainly see this happening with the COVID-19. So as needs are changing around the country, um, both from hospitals and healthcare workers to people who are staying in their homes, hopefully, those products that they need are changing, or sometimes it's the way in which they use them, or it's the speed at which they go through them, or it's how they want to experience them. And so it's about shifting our perspective to think about, okay, what, what would change if someone is sitting in their living room 50% of the time? What are the things that they're going to miss? What are the things they're going to wish that they had? What are the experiences that they don't think are possible that they could have in their living room? What are the things that they're craving? What are the things that they need to do to stay healthy, happy, active, productive? And how can you capitalize on a part of that? And you don't have to answer all of those things with your skills or your experience or your assets or your people or your data, all the things I mentioned before. So and, and, yeah. no, so what you're saying is you, you think about what they need now and you match it up with your core competencies and see how those things mesh together. Yeah. So you can start chicken and egg. So first I start with what are the assets we have now? What do we have in our, in our wheelhouse? And what are the things I can sell immediately right off the shelf? That's the first step I mentioned. Second step is listing all of the assets, human capital, uh, you know, data, things, skills, manufacturing equipment, whatever that might be. And who might need that? So you're going outwards as a, a push. And then you think about now, what are the needs of the customers that we have access to that are low hanging fruit for us? And what do they need that's different? Mm -hmm. And that's your third step. That's where you start to think about what could we change in the product services or offerings that we have sold in the past or what could we create? So it might be a, sh a shift or it might be a totally new creation to solve the needs of our customers. And if, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just saying we can get to maybe some, um, one of the things you have to do in this process is once you do this, you also then have to get the, the people that work with you on board, right? Because absolutely. you're slightly shifting the mission and even maybe even the values of the company. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And we always uh, talk about the core values being, you know, the center of the business and the, and the vision and the experience that you create. And so if you can align with your team that we are in survival mode, we're going to practice some things. We're going to make some mistakes, uh, throw some things against the wall. And this isn't necessarily our forever plan. Mm -hmm. We're not saying that if we do this and we make money that we're going to be doing it forever. And we're not saying that if we do it, make money and it, we do want to do it forever that we expect you to stay with us. But we want you to get through this time as an employee. We want to get through this time together. And mm -hmm. we believe that we can bind together with our creative ideas to come up with solutions that are temporary. And a lot of those things could turn into long-term solutions. But when you're in scarcity, sometimes you just need to get those first few steps so that you can stop the bleeding. I really like this idea that it's a solution now, but not forever. So for example, I have a client who runs a series of physical therapy centers, right? Mm. And they can't see anybody physically. So now they're shifting over to telemedicine, mm -hmm. which interesting enough, Medicare for the first time is reimbursing because of what's going on. And what's really right. been great, if there's any silver lining to coronavirus is it's gonna leap forward telemedicine by a decade because there's been a lot of resistance to it. So now they're doing telemedicine uh, visits. And I really believe when we get back to a point where, and I don't like to say normal, when we get mm -hmm. back to a point where people can actually see each other physically in person, they'll have the physical visit part plus they'll have the telemedicine part. That's totally. the beauty of it. Yeah. And you know, the barrier that was missing before was that the insurance companies didn't trust that there was quality being delivered, right? Now they don't have a choice. They have to trust it. And so there will be quality assurance measures that are introduced after COVID, I'm sure to, you know, kind of tighten up the belt, so to speak. But we will have a lot of innovation happen during this time because of the urgency and because of the necess necessity to be loose in some of those restrictions. So let's, let's talk about a couple of uh, people that are companies that can make the shift, right? Mm -hmm. We have restaurants now that are, you know, doing uh, uh, outtake service, right? Takeout service. And sure. I've always laughed that in Chicago, I've never been able to get a reservation at all these fine restaurants, but now I can do takeout from them. <laughs> so <laughs> right, it's like really my chance to sample their food, right? And pay their prices without actually being there. So that's, you know, 
that you don't get the Alinea experience though, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, think, I think that's a, you know, that's a good thing. All right, you have a tutoring service that perhaps was doing tutoring in person. Now they're tutoring mm -hmm. online. But a lot of companies don't translate as well, right? Right. So right. what about like a, a bowling alley or, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, a bowling, we don't call them bowling alleys. We call them bowling centers, right? Oh, yes. Okay. What yes. about an event rental company? What do sure. they do? Well, I mean, what comes to mind first is obviously within the first, so that first step I talked about, what can we sell right now? There might not be something they can sell right now yeah. unless they're going to do online gaming at that they, people subscribe to, but let, that's really difficult, yeah. right? Because there's so much gaming out there. So then I would move to what do we have? What resources do we have that we could use in a different way to serve our customers or what customers need our services, our products, our people. And so what are the skills required in uh, a bowling center? You have customer service people, you have bartenders, you have cooks, you have people who clean the lanes, you have mechanics who fix the lanes. Um, there are, there, there's tons of space, right? You mm -hmm. have access to teams and communities. So they might partner with local charity as a, uh, a hub for um, the food bank Meals on Wheels using the power of their bowling teams to come and do pickups and each of them are responsible for certain neighborhoods. So they can use this as a central repository for the food and then distribute. And they might charge a fee to the sponsor of that. Maybe there's a corporate sponsor that can charge a fee to use the bowling center. So they're not obviously just donating everything all the time. Um, so that was one idea. There's certainly a shortage of space for extensions of hospitals and hospital beds. And so if they were to con uh, convert bowling lanes with platforms into a kind of remote room so to speak with the curtains like they're doing in new york and, and in i think in chicago as well right. then they might be able to make revenue that way they might be able to use their resources to support companies that are hiring right now and temporarily outsource some of their team to help them continue to work so for example customer service in industries like cable wi-fi are very very busy right now right you know so right. so Companies like that that are needing people who have customer service training where they can get them into a temporary fix. There's lots of ways that they could use the assets that they have, but they have to just think differently that, are we a hospital? No, of course we're not a hospital, but could we use our space, this big wide open space differently temporarily? Yes, we could. Mm -hmm. uh, for the event space, again, that's yeah. similar to, look at the skills that they have. So event space, they have tons of tables and chairs and um, equipment and lighting, they might be able to help with a temporary hospital. They might be able to help with um, people who are setting up temporary offices in their homes mm -hmm. and they need walls. They need uh, sound barriers. They, they're both mom and dad are working at home and they need a temporary setup. Uh, they need um, equipment or supplies to set up a temporary waiting room outside a mobile hospital. Uh, they might change the things that they rent and they might start renting hospital beds. So, or they might become an extension of a hospital or a medical supply rental company and help distribute with their trucks and their team. So there, if you apply the skill in that situation and the knowledge of rentals to a different industry, who else is renting stuff right now? What do they need? And what do they not even know that they need? Like a home desk, for example, where they don't think that they should rent a home desk right now, but if it's affordable enough and you come in and set it up really quickly outside and they pull it in, great. Right, right. I mean, and that, again, it goes back to what is your really your core skill. And, and even if you can't make a lot of money right now, I believe it's important to stay in touch with your community, your loyal yeah. customers. So they're there when you come back. I love I got an email from this travel company that I use for a lot of international travel. And it said simply, when you're ready to travel again, we'll be here. And then they listed some virtual tours that you can take while you're dreaming about where you want to go next. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. It's a way to stay engaged. It's a, it's a way to stay connected. Brewdog beer, which I, I'm a, I have equity in it. So that, you know, full disclosure, but, um, but they, I am a huge brand fan of Brewdog. It's a Scottish brewery. They have a brewery in uh, Ohio now um, and they launched a virtual bar. So mm -hmm. you can get Brewdog delivered, but you can play pub quizzes with them. You can learn how to brew beer at home. They have all of these interactive games, but they made it virtual right off the bat and they didn't even hesitate. It was out within a week, I think, of the mm -hmm. lockdown. 
So the faster you can move, the more you can connect back to your community and people remember you for being there with them. Because there's also a lot of emotional anxiety right now that people are feeling and, and there's a lot of uh, loneliness. And so the brands that reach out to you with authenticity. Jeff, Jeff. Jeff. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> and so, you know, the brands, the, the guide on that is reach out authentically. Don't sell them something right away. Mm -hmm. Um, you always have the rule berry of like, I don't know if it's changed now, but like, you know, seven times and like, you right. know, one of them is selling right. uh, seven communications and one of them sells. Right. And so how do you, how do you stay authentic with them, with humanity, with empathy, with compassion to say, we're hurting too. It's a rough time. And we just want to let you know, we're thinking about you. We hope we can do X, Y, and Z for you, with you you know, because of you in the future. And this is what we're up to, you know, and things like that really make a difference to people, especially right now. And people are craving for any kind of connection, right? And yeah. I was lost with this this morning, how the actual old time phone call is way up. And of course, video calls are way up. And anytime you can keep people connected to that community. I mean, listen, if I'm a big cyclist, right? Even if I can't go outside and use my bicycle, I still want to stay connected to the cycling community because those are my peeps. And anything totally. you can do to promote that, when they're ready to buy again, you're still going to be connected to that brand. And I think the worst part for small business owners, some of them get in this thing of, woe is me. I can't do anything, right? I'm uh -huh. totally shut down. And I believe there's always something you can do. Not always something you can make a lot of money at, but always a way to keep your community together so you're ready when we go into recovery. Right, absolutely. And fortunately, it seems like there are some solutions to at least keep the lights on for most companies right now. Um, and I know you've been really involved in sharing that, Barry. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's one of those things that we can't take for granted and we can't sit back on our laurels, in my opinion. So I think while we have um, safety nets um, for small businesses, I think we have a real opportunity to think about how to disrupt in this new normal, we don't know what it looks like yet, where a small business can be more nimble and faster. And you know, remember I work with a lot of big companies and what I see is that sometimes it takes them 12 to 18 months to turn around a concept because mm -hmm. they have to go through all of the red tape and the bureaucracy and the socialization of ideas. And, and it just takes a long time to make sure that it's safe in their pipeline and that you know they can scale it. But a small company can pivot on a dime and can move really fast in a new direction without having to do all of that testing. They can fail fast. You know, there's, that's an expression a lot of us use in innovation is just fail fast, fail often, and then move on. It's interesting because yesterday I realized two things happened that made me think this, this got just really serious. First of all, Amazon Prime can no longer deliver in two days. I right? know. Like, oh my God, what does the world come to when Amazon can't deliver in two days? And the second thing is, the mayor of Chicago, Lori Lightfoot, just banned all alcohol sales after 9 p.m. Right? Oh my God, what are the Chicago Because people were congregating at places where they were selling alcohol. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily bars, but stores and things like that. So this really kind of serious. The last question I want to ask you is, what do you, how do you think the consumer is really going to change with this happening? And Seth Godin was talking about how this is now Generation C, you know, Generation Corona. Do you think this will have a lasting effect on the consumer psyche? I've been thinking a lot about this. Uh, I do. I think it's going to have a lasting effect on the way that we think about our core values, frankly. Uh, I don't know that we're going to, it's going to be as lasting um, or more lasting than like 9-11 when everyone was being nicer to each other, which I remember it was just, they were, oh, go ahead, drive in front of me, you know, and they were just being so much nicer. I'm going to paint the guy toll in back of me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I do think that from a, so from a societal macro trend perspective, we were already experiencing minimalism. So that was one of the big things that was happening where people were wanting less stuff, especially millennials and younger. They want experiences over stuff. So that was a macro trend before Corona. And I think it's only going to get more elevated after Corona where people are really, at least from my circle of friends and my clients and people I'm talking to, are really craving that connection time and those experiences with their friends that they might not have appreciated as much before. Mm -hmm. So I think the brands and the companies that are wrapped around experiences are going to be the ones that will succeed. And I think the companies who make even the simplest of product or service and experience are going to be the ones that shine through. 
because on the flip side of that, we're also seeing how people are like, oh, I can just make my coffee at home and look at all the money I saved. So we're going to have to have something that makes it worth it for them to go out. And we're going to have to have it tied to their connections and their friendships and their family at work and their community. So I think that's one big thing. I think the other thing, which is also a mega trend, is, and, and this is largely driven millennial and younger as well, and that Generation C that, um, that Seth talks about is also around the environment. And he talks about, you know, the carbon, you know, that Generation C is around carbon. And so we have reduced our footprint significantly, or I shouldn't say the footprint, but the um, effect on the ozone right. and the uh, environmental pollution dramatically since this has happened. So now, basically, Greta Thunberg is proof, you know, she's, her point is proven that if we can all step back and pull back, we can make a difference as a world, as a society. So the pressure is going to be a lot tougher, I think, on consumer packaged goods companies. I think alternative resources like, um, you know, wind power and electric cars and all of those kinds of alternative um, solutions are going to be more pol politically um, supported and more publicly supported uh, because people now see exactly what happened when they were off the road. Uh, and I think that people want to just be better citizens, that they, they want now to be part of this global citizenship. And we have felt this. Now, I'm in Scotland right now, and so I'm having a different experience around uh, the COVID virus. And so I'm experiencing the European news, and I'm experiencing the British news, and I'm watching the U.S. news and just seeing the difference in dynamics. But there's one, um, you know, thread that comes through, which is we're all experiencing the same illness we're all struggling with the same scarcity. We are all worried about our family. We are all you know, cherishing our health and our loved ones. And so there is a unifying effect to that. And I think that all of those things kind of combined is going to make us a bit more sensitive, probably less materialistic, maybe not wanting to have so many goods. So I could see plastic goods going down and I could see uh, disposable clothing going really downhill uh, and people wanting to buy longer term, longer lasting, craft, local uh, goods that are going to put money back into their communities. Well, Tracy, I appreciate you joining me. Tell people where they can get in touch with you and learn about more of the ideas that Bamboo shares with companies. Sure, they can go to bamboexperience.com and we have a link to our YouTube channel where we have 40 different videos or you can just look up Bamboo Worldwide on YouTube. And we have 40 different videos on creativity and innovation um, they're all free and you can watch any of those within under five minutes typically uh, and they have a lot of tools and tips that they can think about things differently. Tracy, thanks so much and stay safe. Thanks, Barry, you too. Bye.